Hey everyone, it's Denise Brown from the Caregiving Years Training Academy. I'm thrilled to have my friend and colleague, Lance Ace Latin, with me here today. Hi, Lance. Good morning, Denise. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. You are the host of All Home Care Matters, which is a YouTube show and a podcast. And we just honored you in the Caring Awards because of your advocacy work through All Home Care Matters. So congratulations, Lance. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. It's interesting to think about the genesis of, genesis of your show because it happened because of the pandemic. You were doing in-person events, right. pandemic stopped it, and then you pivoted to doing a podcast and a YouTube show. Yeah. So four years ago, would you have ever imagined that you created something that has something like 20 million global views through your YouTube channel. No. And <laughs> I, I, I say that without hesitation. And I would say, I don't even still believe it today. You know, it, it was never, it was never on the radar. It was never a driving motivator for why we did the show. You know, as you mentioned, um, we're, we're really big on community advocacy and, you know, supporting seniors and, you know, families with children with disabilities, whatever the scenario or the situation may call for. And when we started our company, it was a result of our personal experience, you know, um, with my father. And I think I've mentioned this to you before. I was actually uh, in the process of pursuing medical school at the time. My wife had already graduated, got her degree, and, you know, I'm finishing and, you know, taking care of what I need to. And all of a sudden we find out we're getting my father moving in with us. And, you know, my wife and I are fairly newly wedded at the time, and she's done with her college and started her career. And it was 24-7 care that he required in you know, we had nurses, social workers, therapists coming to our home three to sometimes five days a week, multiple surgeries for my dad. It was seven, eight, I think eight total surgeries when it was all said and done. Not one time did anybody ever say to us, how can we support you? What kind of help do you need? How is it going? Anything, you know, like that. And I just figured that was normal. Like I didn't even think anything of it, never even identified as a caregiver. Never even thought, oh, I'm a family caregiver. No, I thought I'm a son taking care of my father, doing what I think most children would do for a parent, right? Given the situation. And it was during that experience that I started thinking, okay, you know what? There's got to be help out there some way, somehow. Didn't know what it looked like. Didn't know what it was. So here, you know, myself thinking I invented the wheel. I said, you know, to my wife, we should get a company or do something where, we could send people into homes to help when the nurses, physical therapists, social workers aren't there, or maybe they're not needed, but you need help with all these other things like the ADLs and the personal hygiene, the grooming, toileting, dressing, all that. So started looking into it. Well, very quickly discovered, oh my goodness, there's a whole industry out there that does this exact thing. And so we, we pursued that, you know, um, really thought about it really prayed about it and really did our due diligence. And we quickly felt we had something we could really add. And so I transitioned from medical school to home care. And actually I actually had somebody the other day say, you know, you must have looked back and regretted you didn't uh, continue the medical school route. I said, no one, well, thinking to myself at the time, I said, you know, no one's ever asked me if I've regretted it, but I have no regrets. I would, given the chance, go back. I wouldn't change a thing. Because my whole purpose and my whole drive was for, for medical school and becoming a doctor was to help people. You know what? I just discovered there's other ways that were very appealing to me where I can still help people. And in a way, we're helping people on a much grander scale than if I was doing, you know, primary care or ER doc. Those were my my two, um, you know, kind of desires and goals, one or the other. Um, but we're having such, I feel like such a, as equally, if not better impact on these families doing what we're doing now. You know, it's interesting. You talk about identifying as a family caregiver. It's one of the frustrations I've had is that you shouldn't have to identify as a family caregiver in order to get help and support. It's the experience that you had. Everyone, who, every healthcare professional who came into your home knew what you were doing. Right. Because your 
your father wouldn't have been doing better receiving the care that he needed if you weren't providing it. That in and of itself demonstrates that you're a family caregiver. We show that we are a family caregiver all the time and we show it to healthcare professionals. And it just would be so helpful if it became a natural question that every healthcare professional asked, which is how can we support you? A absolutely. And, you know, I would just, you know, kind of piggyback off of that. Even now, you know, almost 11, 12 years later, since we've started our company, we still encounter nurses and social workers who call or will get, you know, a huge fax or transmission to a document transfer for a patient and they're sending it to us, but it's really meant for like home health care. And then we'll call and we have to educate them what the differences are between home care and home health. It, it's astonishing, you know. Uh, talking to somebody recently, Denise, they said, you know, 10 years ago, and this was their situation, they said, we didn't have nearly the resources we have available now, but it's still not enough. You know, we're we're on the front lines daily, and these families are just, they don't know what they don't know, but how do they get to the point where they know what they need to know? Where does it start at? You know, and my my personal belief is it starts with your primary care doctor. It starts with discharge planners and it starts in the medical schools, you know, educating these, you know, first, second, third, and even fourth year med students. Look, you know, not every patient is going to need home health care where they get that 45 minute to an hour visit from an RN or whatever, but a good majority of families will need to have somebody there supporting them, especially if you have a, a senior or somebody living on their own or you know, we have several families where the person is under Medicare age, but yet they don't really qualify for anything. And the husband or the wife still has to work because they're in their 30s or 40s. But one of them was tragically diagnosed with uh, an aggressive form of cancer or was in a tragic auto accident. You know, where's the help and education for these situations so they're not left fending for themselves? We do a 36-hour Christmas chat. Every year, we open up our chat room for anyone who would like to join us for two minutes or for two hours just to connect to our understanding support. And we had a family caregiver drop in at 11 p.m. on Christmas Eve. Her husband had been not officially diagnosed. She had been working with a neurologist who didn't give her an official diagnosis, so she was in between that terrible in-between land of trying to figure out what was happening. And things were really declining pretty quickly for her husband. And her next appointment was in May. Wow. She would have waited all that time. And we really focused on supporting her. And she stayed with us until she was like, okay, I have to go to bed. And her last words to us was, I feel so understood. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's one other thing I just want to mention. So Medicare has added reimbursement for auxiliary professionals to start to support family caregivers. It could be the family caregiver who's the Medicare beneficiary, or it could be the family caregiver who's helping a beneficiary whose disease process makes it impossible for them to participate in planning and researching for their, for their help and support. I think this is going to be the start of good things. I'm hoping, yes. Yes, fingers crossed. But we have so much work to do, especially when we think about our aging demographic and that we as a country aren't really all that healthy. We we have significant health challenges. And I, I think in the next five years, we're going to see family caregivers caring for several family members, trying to hold down a job and trying to manage the emotional toll that it takes right. to manage that care. Yeah. So you're a, you're an, awesome advocate. And I, I wondered when you started to position yourself as an advocate or think of yourself as an advocate. Honest, truthful answer. Um, I just feel like I'm just doing what I do, if you will. I, you know, I never sought out, uh, you know, I, I've never been one that needed to be in front of a camera, have any sort of media attention, have any sort of notoriety. You know, when we started All Home Care Matters, it literally was a two week project. You know, our uh, so, yes, the show was started because of COVID, but not only because. So what happened was real briefly, we were doing all of these events throughout southeastern Michigan. And 
before our state was shut down, we slowly saw, you know, okay, wow, our support group, we had one person or two person, you know, two people. And then it, all these other events, you know, where we'd have maybe 30 or 40 people. Now we're down to six people, you know, and COVID's out there in the news and then the headlines and, you know, it's causing quite a panic, rightfully so. You know, we started saying, okay, you know what, we we need to start kind of transitioning here to something else. We kind of took the step before the governor took the step on all of the public events. Um, and so I just happened to hear a podcast one evening. We have a track by our house and I like to go there when my kids go to bed. And it was a podcast of a home care company in Michigan, had never heard of them. And it was just the the quality and the messaging was just really, really subpar and poor. And their whole message was, buy our franchise. Well, you know, so I actually went home and told my wife, I said, you know, I got an idea. Why don't we, in the time being, let's start a podcast. I knew absolutely nothing about it. And she reminded me of that. And we uh, we did a lot of research to see, okay, is there space? Is there a need for this in our, you know, industry? And we discovered, yeah, there, there definitely is. And so uh, I took some uh, professional classes with the gentleman's actually a Hall of Fame broadcaster. It was about three, four months in the works. And then we, as you mentioned, uh, in May, it'll be four years that we've had to show up. And, you know, our two weeks in Michigan turned into two more weeks that turned into two months, turned into two years. So we're like, well, we'll just stick with the show. And it just, it caught on for one reason or another. And now it's almost like another full-time job. And But we love it. We enjoy it. And it's just another avenue for us or another branch, if you will, to reach more families that we might not be able to reach in person or in our, in our communities. And uh, yeah, we're enjoying every minute of it. You had mentioned that you would love to change a family caregiver's experience within systems so that the system actually starts to make referrals, ask how they're doing, make right. sure that the family caregiver feels supported. Mm, I'm yeah. curious, if you could solve one other challenge that family caregivers encounter, what would that be? I think for me, it just off the top of my head, it would be having the resources they need when they need them. You know, like you're talking about this lady you know, on Christmas Eve, there's no excuse that she shouldn't have had those resources and that support well before, thankfully, you're doing this 36-hour Christmas chat. Where would she be now if you weren't doing that, right? Why do we have to ask those what ifs? I just feel like, you know, when, and we see this even today, Denise, with the families we help professionally, either before they reach us or even while we're with them, the doctors, the nurses, the office staff, hospital staff, and I'm not trying to paint a, a bad picture because they have a, a lane and they do it exceptionally well, but there needs to almost be a designation as part of that hospital visit or that doctor's office visit, a checklist. Like, do you need help with this? Are you, you know, are you getting enough sleep? And I'm not talking about the patient. I'm talking about the person that brings them, either their child or their spouse, or, or maybe they come with a professional caregiver or a private caregiver, you know, just doing an assessment of what their needs are. You know, when we take, when we take children to pediatric appointments, they'll say, you know, is a child getting three meals a day? Are they adequately clothed? Are they, you know, all these wonderful things, which I'm very thankful they ask these questions, but there should almost be something like that for the adult patient in reverse where, you know, are you requiring assistance going to the bathroom? You know, have you had a fall in the last, you know, 72 hours or whatever, you know, something so they can evaluate, okay, do we need to now take the next step and say, here's some great resources, either at your, you know, area agency on aging, or here's local home care providers, something, caregiver support groups, something so like that lady on Christmas, she doesn't have that feeling of feeling isolated and alone. What's interesting is I think people forget that a family caregiver is a patient too. Right. And they have their own, hopefully, medical appointments. And during that medical appointment, it could be that the physician starts to ask. And with this re Medicare reimbursement model, that's actually what's going to happen. Interestingly, uh -huh. Interestingly enough, in 1996, I partnered with a researcher at the Medi American Medical Association. She wanted to develop a one-page self-assessment that family caregivers could complete while they wait in the doctor's office. And I helped her. I had family caregivers complete the assessment. She used the feedback and the data from that 
to really determine what the tool should look like. And she had developed it and the AMA was using it and promoting it to physicians. And then they stopped. Really? Yeah. I think we started and stopped so many things years ago that now could have made such a huge difference just to be able to sit and reflect on, okay, how stressed am I? How well am I sleeping? What am I worried about? And then have the doctor review it and say, here's some referrals for you. It doesn't have to in, involve a lot of time from a doctor. If a doctor is prepared with, with referral sources, right. it's just referring out to that family caregiver. Well, and just to, to add to that briefly, statistics have shown the family caregiver's health suffers much more dramatically than the person they're caring for, even leading to premature death before the person they're caring for. So, I mean, the data's there, the science is there. We just need to get the, you know, healthcare community to be there. Yeah. And the numbers are going to make it happen. The numbers are going to make it happen. So we're, we're talking at the start of 2024, and I'm curious, what goals do you have for All Home Care Matters for 2024? It, it, no, no real set goal other than, you know, really just wanting to continue doing the best we can, reaching, you know, the people that need these resources and discussions that we have. And for uh, full disclosure, you and I were launching our show in 2024, and for it to be successful. And, you know, um, I think it's going to be a different style of show than what All Home Care Matters is. Um, and, you know, if you'd like to talk about that, I'd be happy or I can talk about it. But um, it's going to be called the Caregiver's Journal. And I think the idea that you and I came up with is going to be really, really beneficial for so many people. I'm really excited about this because we're looking at a day during a caregiving experience that has significance. And we're interviewing family caregivers about that day. And we're starting with diagnosis day. And then we're going to move into the path to the diagnosis, because that can be a very rocky, time-consuming, frustrating path. And the idea is at the end of our episode, we'll have some time to talk about best practices so that we all feel a little more empowered and prepared for these days that really, truly test us. Yeah. And really become our bravest days when we look back. We just don't realize it in the moment. Right. And, you know, uh, just to mention, too, we often have healthcare experts and, you know, different, you know, pillars of the healthcare senior care community. But these are going to be family caregivers. These are going to be experts at family caregiving because they're the ones that have lived it or are living it. And um, I think they're going to bring just some valuable information, perspective, and uh, experiences to the conversation. So I'm, I'm really excited and looking forward to it. Yeah, I am too. Okay, my last question to you. So someone's watching and listening to us and they're thinking, oh my gosh, how did Lance do this? So I guess I'd love for you to share a tip for someone who wants to get started in advocacy work, whether through podcast, YouTube, social media, blogging, writing a book, what yeah. would you suggest? Find what you're passionate about and, you know, jump both feet in the pool. You know, don't get put one toe in and one toe out, you know, find though, don't just pick something to pick something, I guess, is what I would say, you know, find something that you're most passionate about and just go at it full steam ahead and, you know, don't hold back, you know, and for me, it, it's never about the numbers or the likes or the shares or the subscribers. Cause like I said, when we started this, it was just, we're going to do this for a few weeks and then, you know, transition back to our community events. I have, I personally, you know, and I'm not trying to minimize it or make it sound a lot easier than it is. Cause it's not easy or else, you know, the cliche, everyone would do it. Right. But I feel like if you find something that you're really, you know, driven by and passionate about, it's not work first and foremost. So you're going to enjoy and love doing it anyhow. And I, I really feel like everything else falls in behind that. If you're doing it for the right reasons, the right motives, and it's something that is very, very personal and something that you're very passionate about, I think really the rest will take care of itself. It's really interesting. The lived experience can inspire your advocacy work. And you shared your yeah. lived experience when we started our conversation Absolutely. and what it led to. Yeah. Amazing. Okay, Lance, for those who are watching and listening who'd like to be in touch with you, 
How can they reach you? Uh, they can visit our website, uh, allhomecarematters.com. There's a contact form on the homepage or there's a contact tab. However, there's several ways on the site or they're welcome to email us directly at contact at allhomecarematters.com. Lance, thank you so much. This was fun. Always a pleasure, Denise. And thank you for all that you do too. Thanks everybody for watching. I'm Denise Brown. Visit our community, caringourway.com to stay connected to us. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.